So it is my pleasure to introduce Gwendolyn Kaiser, today's um, teacher naturalist and presenter from Audubon, Vermont. Gwen has been with Audubon, Vermont since 2005, but she was introduced to programs before that um, with her daughter. She was coming to programs together, particularly at our preschool programs, um, so not to age Gwen, but <laughs> her daughter <laughs> is much older now. So Gwen um, has been um, deepening her connection to Audubon for years. She is a dedicated teacher and a naturalist. Um, I have had the pleasure of going out with Gwen back when we all used to do things in person, going out birding with Gwen and teaching with Gwen and her enthusiasm is infectious. I often would find myself, we would be out birding and I would ask Gwen like, what is that bird? Um, and she'd be like, well, let's listen to it sing first. And then I would get distracted and I would say, well, Gwen, what's this plant? <laughs> She's always patient and would tell me the bird and then also the plant. Um, so Gwen has put together a wonderful presentation for us today. It's really exciting. We were talking about how there's just so many birds and so many things we would love to share with you, but we only have an hour. So we're gonna do our very best. Um, with that, I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Gwen and I'm gonna be here on the back end. So as I said, um, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I will be able to respond to them. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and welcome again to all of you. I see we have 138 people on the call today. So it's very exciting to see all this enthusiasm about birdsong and it's the perfect time of year. Um, so I just wanted to start off by thinking about what bird songs are you hearing right now? And um, I'm not sure if you are able to have the window open right now where you are, um, or if, if you've been outside on a walk today, but I'm guessing that you've heard quite a few bird songs already today. Um, and especially in the springtime with spring migration and birds moving through who are not even staying in, in your region um, for the whole year, it can be a little overwhelming, especially that dawn chorus of bird song where they're all just interwoven. Um, and when I started working at Audubon, um, I was really a plant person. I really was not a bird person at all. Um, and so it was, was very overwhelming. And over time, I've just learned a few new bird songs every year. And, um, and I really focus on um, getting excited about a few species. And then the next year you, you move on to some more. And before long, you've, you've just got this whole library of song in your brain. And um, it's a really great way to interact with birds. Um, especially once, once the leaves come out on the trees, it's a lot harder to see the birds, but they're mostly, you know, they're gonna be singing and, and they'll oftentimes keep singing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump right into it. So the question about um, bird song is why, why are birds out there singing? And um, of course, this time of year, um, as birds are returning uh, from migration to their nesting grounds, they're singing to attract a mate. And oftentimes it's the males who are singing loudly and performing that, that bird song. Um, the other thing that they'll do in terms of attracting mate is that they're going to be claiming territories. And red-winged blackbirds are a good example of this, um, where the males come back to their, their nesting territory before the females do, and then they work it out with each other. Um, they talk about what their boundaries are, and then when the females come, they choose their mate based upon their territory. Um, birds will sing to communicate about food. So especially in the wintertime, you'll hear flocks of robins um, that are coming together and talking about where the good berries are. Um, and then once, once birds have their nests of young, those young birds are gonna make a lot of noise to, to let the parents know that they're hungry. So you'll hear that sort of song and they're also learning their song. Um, birds also sound alarm. Alarm songs are a really um, good way for birds to communicate with each other's, um, both within the species as well as across different bird species. And then I also believe that birds are singing to express joy because um, how, how could they not enjoy that song? Um, so, and we certainly do ourselves. So here's a good example. Here's a good red-winged blackbird defending that territory. Um, on the right here, we have Eastern bluebirds and you have the, the, um, the young right there with its mouth wide open singing about needing, needing some insects for food. Um, and then here we have a pair of Canada geese that are um, working out their territories as well. 
Um, and I wanted to, well, I'm going to be focusing mostly on bird songs, but I wanted to start a little bit with that, with those alarm calls. As I was searching for bird songs, I came across this video and I wanted to share it with you because it, it really gets into um, that why birds are communicating and how they're communicating. And in the chat, if, if the sound is not loud enough, let me know. So here you hear the blue jay calling its own name. And that is going to alert all the other birds that, that there is a problem, that there is a, there's a danger. So birds make lots of different sounds, not just their song. So that there's, there's that, uh, that really high pitched call to alert about a hawk coming. <clears throat> and this is really interesting talking about that messages of the chickadee. And you hear that the longer that that alarm call is, the higher the level of danger. And so these are the red winged blackbirds. And that absence of birdsong is really a good cue um, when you're out listening that, that something is going on. Um, so I just wanted to, before we jump into those songs, think about when those birds are singing and um, what it's going to mean. Let's see here. So um, when we're thinking about birdsong, um, one thing that has really helped me is to put words to the songs. Um, and so mnemonic, a mnemonic is what um, we call that when we're using that pattern to help us remember, remember something. So the chickadee is a, a per perfect example of that mnemonic. And so um, we think of the chickadee, it has two songs. One is a mating song, but its alarm call is really sounds like its own name. And I'm going to play that for you right here. And it's alarmed of a, um, a falcon. I'm sure this this alarm song is very alarm call is very familiar to to all of you. So starting off, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of us already recognize a lot of bird song. So I'm going to start with some some simple songs here. Um, the American Crow is one that everybody recognizes. <laughs> Similarly, I believe a lot of us recognize the raven as well. And you'll notice that its, it's call is a much more raspy song. And it's a, a deeper throaty call. nice to hear them all. It's, it's pretty rare in Vermont that we see more than two ravens together, so it's nice to hear these all together. The black capped chickadee and the mating call right there is uh, two different notes and the mnemonic I put with that is, hey sweetie, hey sweetie. It helps, helps to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, another common song call that I'm sure we recognize overhead is the call of the Canada Goose. And then another one that's often right, right nearby a lot of us are, is the Blue Jay. And we teach kids that it's calling its own name, Jay, Jay, very insistent. And as this video goes on here, you can hear that the, the J makes lots of other vocalizations. And that's not, that's not the J right there. Pop ahead to, it's got sort of a wordly 
kind of warbly song it does there. I guess it's classic. And then moving on to birds that, that I'm, it's likely that you've been hearing already um, in the spring here, uh, the morning doves, and you'll mostly see those in pairs. They're very loyal to each other. It's a very cooing sound. It's a nice clear, it's almost, almost owl-like. And just the, the quality of that song is very distinctive, not like any other bird song that's out there. Moving on to the song of the robin. The robin is a song that, um, the robin and the cardinal both, they have so many different vocalizations and they're so common and right around us that um, it's one of those birds where it's, they're so uh, gregarious that oftentimes you can see them singing. So actually seeing the bird singing um, while you're um, you, you, having your eyes on the bird while it's singing can be really powerful in, in solidifying that memory of the song. It's a very bouncy sound. I'm going to pause it right there. The, the mnemonic that we that we teach for the robin is a swinging cheerio, cheerily, cheerio, cheerily, cheerio, cheerily. And I'm going to play that again so you can kind of hear, hear the words to, to the mnemonic yourself. And if you want to, you're all on mute right now. So if you want to sing along with the robin, that's another really great way to, to like strengthen those patterns in your brain of, of memory. If I can't hear you, go ahead and sing along with that robin. <laughs> very, very swingy, bouncy you know, song. And here we have the song of the Northern Cardinal. It's a more piercing piercing quality to the to the song. And that would cheer, would cheer, would cheer, would cheer. Um, this bird wakes me up all the time. It's up before the sun comes up. <laughs> and um, the the mnemonic we have is not a word, but it's um, it's really compelling. If I'm sure most of you have seen Star Wars, so the lightsaber that that shoo, 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 that's what we teach kids um, for the mnemonic. Yeah, so there it is again. And then the other song that I've been hearing a lot in my neighborhood is the Pileated Woodpecker. And it's the classic Woody Woodpecker song. That bird is not even opening its mouth. <laughs> really interesting. And if, for those of you with a really keen, keen ears there, you could hear the morning dove in the background. I'm just going to play that one more time. This is a great video capture of, of really capturing the song right when you're seeing it singing. So, and those, those um, as the spring goes on, it's, it's a really good time to, to build your birdsong vocabulary. Um, and just as the birds arrive back, learn the birds that are here. So these are three that, that have come back early in the springtime. The first is the red-winged blackbird, one of the first to come back. Uh, the mnemonic that I wrote right out here is conflory. And so you can hear that if you'd like to sing along with it. Let me give it a play.
and it's definitely definitely the harbinger of spring once they're back i know i've gotten through my night my long vermont winter wow. that's just an amazing video capture there and then you hear the geese in the background Moving on to a bird that says its own name, the Eastern Phoebe. This bird has a very scratchy uh, voice. Um, and let's listen to it. Uh, we have a bird song game that we play with kids. And so we teach them the, the mnemonics. And oftentimes we like, I, I have them scrunch up their whole face when they're practicing this song. So. Go ahead, you're on mute. <laughs> Sing along with the Phoebe. Just it's saying Phoebe. Just really grit your teeth, scrunch your scrunch your eyes up, and belt it out. <laughs> and I'm hearing them all around the neighborhood now. They're, they've come back, and they're they're very loyal to where they nest. So they'll they'll come back and nest in that same spot year after year. And this bird, the white-throated sparrow, um, I live in the south end of Burlington. Um, so it's a it's kind of a suburban area. And they, so the white-throated sparrows nest in the forest, but during migration, they all spend time, they drop out in town and they visit bird feeders and they clean up in the gardens um, to, to eat all of the to, to forage in the leaf litter. And so, this, for the last few weeks or so, I've been hearing white-throated sparrows in my neighborhood, um, but they've, they've pretty much all disappeared. I heard just one today when I was out walking the dog. So here's the song of the white-throated sparrow. It sings, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Let's hear it again. Such a such a clear, strong song. It's just it's a real, real beauty to hear in the springtime. Debbie, I want to take a second to see if there's any questions in the chat before I just keep keep piling on the bird songs. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, first, I want to recognize um, Marianne and his mentioning that her cats are going crazy right now at her house. <laughs> um, and my cats as well are like what is happening which is that's very fun. exciting <laughs> um diane was wondering if you could speak on the difference between a song and a call and when might they be used um and how might they be used right thanks that's a great question so a bird song i think of as um what the birds are singing to attract mates so it's uh quintessentially what what they're saying and and this it's like their identity so that the, how that they identify each other amongst all those other birds that are singing um, a bird call is a shorter vocalization and it's usually used like for alarm of alarm calls um, it's used to mm, if if there's a mated pair and they're talking about their location and but they don't want to really like belt it out to everybody else. That's that's what you're he'll, you'll feel and hear from a call, rather than a song. And Any other, go ahead. Yeah, and related. Um, I'm sorry, I lost your name here in the in the chat. But was mentioning that the woodpecker one year the woodpeckers were pecking um, on the house and it was so mm -hmm. loud. And yes. I mentioned in the chat that sometimes woodpeckers will use their drumming as a way to sort of like a bird song they use that drumming establishing territories and they will find like the loudest thing and i let them know how often we'll be teaching a program and <laughs> the sap suckers will go on the metal roof of our sugar house to just make the loudest possible drumming sound um, that is still distinctive and unique to that bird yes and I, I have that a little later on here so yeah 
Yeah, so uh, it's not just the songs, it's the, the drumming as well can be used for, for attracting a mate. Um, and then Carol was asking, um, which I think you mentioned this later too, Gwen, but it's nice to put it in here now. Is there an app where you, where as you are outside, you can figure out what bird you are hearing? I would love to identify birds by sound, but I don't know how when I am outside. And maybe as you address that, you could also give us some best practices of playing bird sounds while we're outside. Absolutely. So the bird app that I use is the Audubon bird app, and that is a free app. And for each species, it has actually quite a few different songs. Um, so it'll help you um, help you narrow down those different vocalizations for, for different birds. And what Debbie, Debbie was saying about um, the ethics around using those bird songs. So just like when we're playing this here and your cats are very excited, um, if you go out in the field and you play bird song, um, that, that can be distracting, alarming, uh, depending on the song that you're playing or the call that you're playing. So if you go out and you play a chickadee's alarm call, that's gonna set off all the other birds that can hear it and they're gonna be on high alert that something's going on. Um, so it's best practice to, to use um, earbuds um, to have it just for you when you're in the field. Um, so that's, and then I build, I'm not sure, Debbie, maybe you could help me out here. Is there currently an app that will, um, like that you could hold up your phone to, to hear the bird song? Um, to identify it. I feel like I've heard of, of that being in the works, but I'm not sure that that exists. I have not um, seen one that's quite like that. And I'm not sure about Merlin, because I know Merlin will also help you if you see a bird, help you figure out, but you're not sure what it is, help you identify right. it. The Audubon app does that well as well. So you can put in like, it's about the size of a robin and it's these colors. You can also do that with bird songs in the Audubon app. So you can say, it's a whistle and I'm in the forest and they'll help narrow it down that way, but not as smart yet as... Um, not like, um, like they can do it with songs. Exactly. Like popular songs. But that would be incredible. That would be a good, yes. Um, what was I gonna say? And the other thing that you can narrow down in the, the Audubon bird app um, is your location. So if you say you're birding in Vermont, it's not gonna show you all those Western birds that you're not gonna see. Any other questions in the chat before I move along? Those are all the questions, but the chat is exciting because folks are sharing with one another um, uh, resources. So some folks are saying that they've tried um, iBird and um, a couple of other apps with some success um, for, for IDing by sound. So I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna keep cultivating that for us. But I think that is all the questions so far. Thanks, Gwen. Sure. And the other resource I wanted to mention is um, there's a series of CDs called Birding by Ear. And um, it's, I believe, George Eliot is, is the author, um, the creator of those. And I really, I just, when I was first learning bird song, I just kept listening to those over and over again. And he really was great at breaking them down into birds that sound a little similar, but like, here's the thing that's different, or these birds sound similar, but you'll only see this bird in a wetland and you'll only see this bird on a mountaintop. So um, when you're, whenever you're using bird song, um, paying attention to what's, a pos what's possible for, for where you are. So that's another, another great way to, another great resource. And he has birding by ear and birding by ear too, and it's, I imagine it's, I have the, the CDs, they're on my back porch right now, but I imagine that they're available online as well. All right, so moving on to a few simple songs, bird songs, the tufted titmouse. This bird sings straight through the winter, so it's, it's an easy one to familiarize yourself with when there aren't a lot of other birds singing. And its mnemonic is Peter, Peter, Peter. So a real clear whistle. Another bird that's a super simple call is the, are both the nut, nut hatches, the white breasted and the red breasted nut hatch. Um, it's described as making a sound that sounds like yank, yank. And here it comes. So it's a very nasal vocalization. 
There's the white-breasted nuthatch. And it sounds like somebody is, make sure you're, everybody is on mute there because I'm getting a little background noise. Yeah, That's I'm it. hearing that too, Gwen. And everyone, um, I think, found it. Okay, perfect. You found it? Okay, <laughs> sure. It's like, is it my, uh, yes. Uh, so here's the red-breasted nuthatch. So it's a little, it still has that same nasal quality but it's a shorter call. And I'll go back to the white breasted again. Pretty much the same. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little, this is one where it would be helpful to see it, right? <laughs> you can't get it entirely by ear. And they're very clearly got the white breast and the red breast on, on these birds. And there's a little different vocalization from the white breasted nuthatch, a faster, faster call there. But that nasal quality is really very distinctive for the nuthatches. So here's a collection of birds that sound a little bit like other animals. So we're going to start off with the gray catbird, which sounds like a cat. And um, the catbird is a mimic, and so it'll sound like a whole lot of other birds as well. And there's two different mimics. Um, and in Vermont, we don't, um, uh, the mockingbird, <laughs> all of a sudden I lost the name of the bird. Um, the mockingbird is another um, pretty popular or, or familiar mimic. Um, and the gray catbird, the way you can distinguish between the songs of the gray catbird and the, um, why? the common mockingbird is that the gray catbird gives its um, songs in two note phrases, whereas the mockingbird does repeats the song three times. So here's here's the call of the gray catbird. So it's it hasn't really done that the cat noise yet, but you can hear that, that hair. And I find it's often when it gets to the end of its singing that it does that, that cat, cat call. And they've got a lot to say. <laughs> there you go. So that meow. There you go. Then moving on to the American goldfinch. Um, this one has uh, the mnemonic we teach for it is that it says potato chip, potato chip. Um, but then it also does this squeaky kind of piggy whistle. So take a listen to this one. Is that a dreamy? Just the quality, that squeaky quality to that, to that song is very distinctive. No other bird is, is making that noise out there. And then you can hear that. Yeah, so squeaky. And then moving on to the chimney swift, um, it's um, it's a very chattering noise. So I'll, whoops, sorry. And it's just that, it's such a summer evening kind of noise. And um, what you're seeing here is you're seeing chimney swifts roosting. So they're going to their their nighttime roosting location in a chimney. This is probably a good time for me to mention um, 
that Audubon Vermont coordinates are for the state of Vermont, our Chimney Swift Recovery Project. And we are looking to people in the community to help us know where chimney swifts are nesting and where they're roosting. Um, so if you go to our website, which is vt.audubon.org, and um, under, our, under our priority bird species, you can find the Chimney Swift Project. And it has details about how to submit your sightings. And basically it's, it's on eBird that we've, we're asking you to submit your sightings of, about chimney swifts um, so that we can better understand, especially where they're roosting and nesting um, so that we're, we will be able to conserve that habitat. Um, and the other thing that we're doing to help out chimney swifts is we're building sw chimney swift towers um, in order to provide additional habitat for chimney swifts. Uh, so moving on to the fourth of the birds that sound like other animals. <laughs> this bird, I gotta tell you, I when I first heard this bird, I thought it was my dog whining to get out of, of the house. I was outside, I was in a hammock, and I heard this high pitched noise and I had no idea that it was a bird, so take a listen. Do you hear it coming in there? So it's just that super high pitch. It's mostly you hear kids. <laughs> but just that that high pitched kind of tight, tight, tight song up there is the cedar waxwing. So moving on to, to a couple of, of woodpeckers that we have here that nest in Vermont. I'm going to start with the red bellied woodpecker, which is actually um, a bird that we did not used to see nesting in Vermont. This is a bird that has expanded its range due to climate change. And it has a very distinctive, um, it almost sounds like a, a tree frog. That's not it yet. <laughs> there it is. So it's just a burst of, like a burst of a trill. And you, you'll notice it's called the red-bellied woodpecker, but the, the red on its belly is very subtle. It's, it's got most of its red on the back of its head. So the other woodpecker that I am able to really distinguish by its sound is the call of the downy woodpecker. And this, this is a, a pretty high-pitched call, and it starts, starts high and sort of descends. So let's, let's take a listen there. So very high pitched, but the, the tone of it is, is coming down in pitch. Heard a cat bird there. I wanna hear that downy woodpecker again. <laughs> Might need to scoot back to the beginning here. Let me get that again for you. So that right there. So that. And then a couple of very distinctive woodpecker drumming sounds. Um, first off, the yellow bellied sapsucker. And with the yellow bellied sapsucker, sap, ah, that's a mouthful, the yellow bellied sapsucker, it's the tempo of its drumming that is very distinctive. So it starts out at a quick tempo, and then as it reaches the end of its drumming, it slows down. So rapid at the start, and then slowing the tempo. Let's hear it again. It kind of feels like doing doing a program in the field where we wait for the birds. So there you go. That tempo starts out. It's it's very rhythmic and it's very distinctive. It's always that same same rhythm for the yellow-bellied sapsucker. 
And then the pileated woodpecker is another one you can tell um, just, just because of the sheer size of the pileated woodpecker, which you know it's, the bird is probably over a foot in, in, um, in height. Um, it's a very resonant drumming noise. And here's one at the top of a utility pole. So this is more about communicating than it is about. So you can really hear that resonance. Can you do that again? And they, boy, they can make short work of a tree that that um, is on its way out. Um, really, if they're a good, um, they're a good cue that that you've got something wrong with your tree if if you're starting to see holes from the pileated woodpecker. Uh, so I wanted to share a couple, kind of in the middle. I know that that we've been doing a lot of bird songs. It can get a little overwhelming, so I wanted to kind of break it up with some some strange bird sounds. So this is the American woodcock. It has a very interesting courtship display, but I wanted Brenda to point out its, its vocalization is, is very strange and distinctive. You hear that? So these are birds that just make me laugh. The next one is the hooded merganser. And I, I had no idea what, that this bird made such a strange sound until I was teaching a homeschool program a couple of years ago. And we were doing an, a bird's bird um, field mark activity. And it's very distinctive in its field marks. And um, one of the students says, have you ever heard what it sounds like? I'm like, no, I haven't. I would not have believed that this was a bird that, that was making this sound. So take a listen. That growling noise is the merganser. And it's with a couple of mallards there. And it makes a kind of a pop noise too. I'm not sure if you can hear that here. But it's just the funniest, funniest noise that you would not expect from a duck. <laughs> and then the last one I have for you is the American bittern. And let's see. I'm hoping are we going to play the video? Whoops. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm hovering over it. It's not happening. Oh. All right. Well, getting ahead of myself here. So the American bittern makes it makes a like a a glugging noise. It's like boom 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 boom. boom, boom. So that's um, although the video would not provide, I actually do a really good bittern. So that's that's what it sounds like, um, and it, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it was a bird. <laughs> All right, so moving from strange songs to absolutely beautiful songs. So here are four of my, my favorite bird songs. And three of these are thrushes, the viri, the wood thrush, and the hermit thrush. And the thing that's unique about the thrushes is that they, their spherinx or their voice box, they're able to vocalize two different tones at the same time. Um, so the first song I'm gonna play is of the viri, and it sounds, it sounds like a ball spiraling down um, down a tube. So take a listen to the Viri. That's its call. And there's the song. So really just ethereal. I could just play this for the rest. <laughs> this is my, my favorite bird song. 
there's there's so many that are good but this is my favorite so moving over to another thrush the wood thrush what's really distinctive about this bird song is um there's sort of a shattery um quality at the end of its song each each phrase that it has so listen to the, the wood thrush You hear that? Yep, yeah, so that's, and um, oftentimes you'll have a hard, you know, you, you'll hear both wood thrush and hermit thrush singing in the forest. And that the end of the tone, that, that shattery sound is, is what will help you distinguish that as the wood thrush. Um, and here's the hermit thrush, which is the state bird of Vermont. So it just, you can hear both tones, but it doesn't have that same ending to its phrase. And they just really belt it out. I just love like, like how they put their whole body into it. And I was lucky they they've just arrived from migration and I live right near Red Rocks Park and there is at least one but there's there's one that has just been at the top where all the headlocks are and it's just been sitting out every day and and I've been able to see it almost every morning when I when I walk by and it just sits out and sings for all the world so beautiful. And then the last is the common loon that I wanted to share. And, many and that goes into a lot of words, but just that that haunting, echoey, such a rich, rich song of the common moon. Um, moving into a like it, it helps to kind of think about the quality of song when when you're thinking about bird song. So a couple of birds that have super sort of bubbly and speedy songs. The first is the bobolink. And let's see, this one starts in a little late, so let's see. Second 34, so I'm going to scoop this ahead. It's just, just sitting there for a while, but here it is. Maybe I've gone too far. Oh, I, I did go too far. Let me just back it up, put it here. There we go. Yeah, so that, that's the bobolink. And um, I, they say that it sounds, that the mnemonic, or the memory device for the bobolink, that it sounds a little like R2-D2, the robot. That's our second Star Wars um, mnemonic here. So bird, birders are a little nerdy. So let, let's hear the bobolink again. It's got a very metallic quality to its song. very fast and, and bubbly. And then moving on to the winter wren. Um, this is a bird that nests in, in the forest interior, oftentimes on um, the roots of, of trees that have been upturned. And um, Bridget Butler taught me that this sounds like a guitar solo in the woods. So take a listen to this. It's just so beautiful, the video, you can just see it all. So that's, there's the winter wren. It, it seems like it shouldn't have enough air to, to sing that whole song. It's just so long and so boisterous and so strong. So shifting gears into a couple of slow songs, the vireos. Uh, the red-eyed vireo is the bird that you'll most commonly hear, and these in, went in Vermont. Um, they have a song, and they'll sing all day long. They don't just sing in the morning, and they're very consistent about putting their song out there. 
and the mnemonic of the red-eyed vireo says, look at me, way up high, over here, in a tree. So see if, see if you can fit those words with this song. And the blue-headed vireo, or it's also known as the solitary vireo, has the same vocalization, but there's a longer pause between its phrases. And so if you're used to hearing the red-eyed vireo, I, I find myself kind of expecting to hear that next phrase. Um, but if you're waiting for it, then what you're listening to is the blue-headed vireo. And then the last, the last bunch of birds I wanted to share with you are the warblers. And there are so many warbler songs and um, there's a lot of mnemonics to help keep track of them. I'm gonna start easy uh, with the yellow warbler. And this bird you'll find singing in the wetlands and it sings, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. So let's take a listen to the warbler, the yellow warbler. And often, the warblers often have a, the quality of their song is often similar. And so you have to rely on the pattern of the vocalization, which is where the mnemonics are so handy. So sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. So if you can kind of say those words as you're listening to it, that really helps, helps remember those songs. The next one, this bird, um, so for, Talking about habitat, this bird is often found in early successional habitats, so shrubby, dense areas is where it's like to nest. And its mnemonic is please, please, please to meet you. And it's interesting because like that's that's the mnemonic. And for years I was like, okay, well now but which bird says please, please, please to meet you? And so I started adding, you know, just saying what its own name is to that mnemonic in my head, and it now it sticks. So it please, please, please to meet you. I'm chestnut-sided warbler. <laughs> so here it is. <gasps> Here's the yellow belly snap sucker too. Please, please, please to meet you. And then the third warbler here we have is the black and white warbler. And this one doesn't have a mnemonic that I know, but it what I what I think about is that it sounds like a squeaky wheel going round and round. So it's a high pitched song. And a kind of a squeaky high pitched. Squeaky high pitch song. So I have a few more warblers for you. <laughs> uh, the common yellow throat is another wetland warbler, um, and its its um, nickname is the bandit bird. It's got this black mask on it, and this is one I actually can tell by by seeing it by eye. Um, and its mnemonic is witchity, witchity, witchity. There it is. And I haven't heard the distinctive call yet, so it's, there we go. Very bouncy song, witchity, witchity, witchity. Ah, yeah, that's gorgeous. <clears throat> and then for these next two warblers, I'm going to give credit to, to our um, conservation biologist, Steve Hagenboo, for, for these mnemonics. Um, well, not the mnemonics, but the, the, um, how he describes distinguishing between the two of them. So the black throat and green warblers, he says it helps him to remember thinking about the green mountains that, that go up and down. So the black-throated green warbler song is z z z z z. So that's up and da da da. 
So listen to it singing up and down. Z, 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 Z. And these ones just arrived back in Vermont. I was greeted at Red Rocks Park yesterday by a black-throated green warbler just belling it out. The black-throated blue warbler, um, they have a song that just goes up, 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 up to the blue sky. So with the blue in their name, and here it is. Z, Z, Z. Let's hear that again. All right. That's the black throated blue warbler. And I'm just going to do one, one more collection of warblers for you. Um, the oven bird. This is, this is a bird that'll sing all day long. And um, the mnemonic for it is pizza, 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 pizza. And it, it goes through a crescendo. So it starts off softer, gets louder as it sings. And I like the mnemonic of, of pizza um, because it makes a nest on the ground that looks a little bit like a pizza oven and it's made out of leaves. Um, the next warbler we have here is the golden winged warbler and its song is a bee buzz buzz. That's it. So very buzzy. And this is another early successional habitat bird. Play that one more time for you. And then the last warbler I have for you today is the Blackburnian warbler, which is a very high pitched song. You'll see it up in the treetops, and it's just a gorgeous bird. So this is this is worth um, this is worth find, you know taking out the binoculars and seeking this bird out when you hear it. And it's a very high pitched song. And it, it even gets higher as the song, as the phrase goes on. And a very, very fast pace to its song as well. So I'm going to take a pause right here. Um, and I'm noticing that the time, oh my goodness, is 1.58. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer some questions for you folks. Um, so Debbie, if you want to... Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, and folks, if you've got questions, um, feel free to pop them in. But Karen was wondering, um, so as you've sort of broken down birds and you have mentioned when you were hearing birds in Burlington, which for Vermont is a biggest city, but for other places is hardly a city. Do you have any um, tips for what birds someone might hear in the city? Karen in particular is in Philadelphia, but um, for, for city folks or suburban folks, what do they got? Hmm, let's see. So I'm thinking um, you're going to be hearing the robin, you're going to be hearing the cardinal, the chickadee will be right there, certainly crows, um, and their vocalizations will be interesting. Like They're, they're so amazing to watch um, and see what they're, they're doing in community. Um, chimney swifts, definitely you will be seeing in the city. Um, let's see. Uh, house sparrows will definitely be, you'll be able to see those right in the city. The, and the Audubon app is really, really kind of good for that. Or eBird is a great resource um, where you can um, take a look at a, look up a birding hotspot or just look up where you are. And then birders who are nearby you will submit the birds that they've seen. So that's a really nice way to, um, to kind of get narrow down um, what birds are out there that have been seen by birders who know them. Um, and then to go out and, you know, familiarize yourself with the songs and then listen for them as you're moving through the world. Um, and I would say, I think a lot of resources listed as backyard birds. So if you're mm -hmm. out looking for field guides, things that say backyard birds for the east, backyard birds for the south, um, those tend to be um, birds that don't really mind people habitats. Right. Um, so Roseanne is doing something that often we get calls at our office, 
Um, <laughs> the funny thing is she typed it, so I have to do it. But Roseanne <laughs> is wondering if you know what bird sounds like a wolf whistle, like wit you, which I'm imagining is like a um, She lives in New Jersey. I've, I've never, I haven't been to New Jersey since I was a kid, so that's not gonna help me, but um, I'm gonna, is it the starling that has the wolf whistle? I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up my, my Audubon bird app right now and see if that's it. Cause I, I know exactly what you're talking about when you say the wolf, wolf whistle. And, um, but I haven't heard it yet this spring. And so it's not fresh. And it's interesting because every year I feel like I need to refresh my bird song memory because you don't hear a lot of them through the winter. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see Betsy suggesting maybe it is a cardinal. Hmm. Cardinal is, is more, it's not as wolfy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the cardinal definitely does have a, a really strong call. Let's see here. I'm not hearing anything. We might have to pose that one and um, uh, yes. find out resources with um, um, yep. to jot that one down because I'm, I'm going to do a little more research. Add that one. Um, <laughs> Katie is saying, are you sure it's not a construction worker? Um, mm, yeah, that, yeah, you're right in New Jersey, huh? <laughs> um, and Roseanne is saying that um, they hear it all the time in the summer, but they haven't heard it yet this spring. So that's a good clue, Roseanne. Yeah, yep. Um, that it might be a, a late arrival. We'll see what we can what we can drum up for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Starling, but could be Grackle. Um, and we've got some folks sharing some exciting bird things like there's a cerulean in Central Park Ooh, last week. That's exciting. Cerulean um, warbler. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I, I don't think you said, Gwen, but you have yep. done here is um, you have organized birds in groups and you've put the similar things together. Do you find that that helps um, as, as you're learning to try to group them that, group them that way? Absolutely. Yes. And, and I think it's actually um, Lang Elliott. I was noticing on some, I wanted to give a huge thank you to YouTube and all of the folks who have uploaded these just spectacular bird song videos. Um, but Lang Elliott had a number of videos there and that's, that's who did the birding by ear um, series. And yes, definitely grouping it by like, just so it's not just random. So, you know, like you're grouping things together. And I actually wrote last spring during the early in the pandemic, I wrote a few articles about, um, about birding by ear and we can share those with you afterwards as well. And really broke it, broke it down into those categories. Any other questions out there? That is it. Um, and we're okay. running up on time, but I know you had we something are. fun coming up. So well, this, yes. Yeah, so for, for folks, um, Let's see. So this is a, a little bird song quiz, if you'd like to play it with me. Um, so the way this works is I'm going to play a bird song and Debbie's going to put in the chat, um, or I guess it, it shows up on the screen, a poll. And so each of these birds has a mnemonic, which will show up in the poll. And what we would like you to do is to, to the best of your abilities, match the words to the song. So there... Whoops, there's the poll and I need to scoot it over so that I can, whoop, and now I made it big. And I'm going to play the song. So. so this is what I taught you already today. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at that. We're getting, we're getting a lot of right answers. We've got 80%. So some folks are saying oven bird, some are saying common yellow throat. We've got what, a couple of votes in there for the red winged blackbird. And I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Uh, let's see. So uh, this is not actually democracy. It's, <laughs> it's um, the right answer was the common yellow throat. That bouncy song, it's not exactly the same. And individuals have different 
you know, variations on their song. So this sounds a little different than the one that I played whenever I was introducing it. Witchity, witchity, witchity. There we go. And the other songs here are the crow. And then, whoops, let me just get them all going and together. It'll be just like the spring, spring dawn chorus. Here's the red winged blackbird. Conglory. And then the oven bird talking about pizza. And the crescendo of starting quietly and getting louder. Do we have time for one more round? If you need to jump off the call, go ahead. But um, if you can play another another round, um, we've got four more birds for you. And so we have the Northern Cardinal, the Eastern Phoebe, the Canada Goose, if it's the Goose, I hope you know it, and the American Robin. So take a listen to this song. A lot, of, a lot of good answers coming in there. Okay, one more time for you. All right. It is indeed the song of the Eastern Phoebe saying its own, own, own name in a very raspy tone. And the other ones we have here are the Northern Cardinal. Very much like a car alarm. I hadn't, um, our intern Alexander put some of these mnemonics together. And, and that's a beautiful thing about mnemonics is it, if a saw bird song reminds you of something and that's compelling, if you remember it, that's gonna, that's gonna be more compelling than like what the birders all say is, is the mnemonic. So, and then we already, whoops, hold on a second. We already heard the Eastern Phoebe. And let's see, my pole is getting in the way here. We know the sound of the Canada goose, and I'll play the robin for you. Cheerio. Very swinging song. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to jump past our next two bird song rounds to um, just make sure that I do leave you with a bit of an action plan because um, there's so many of you here today. And so I'd like to engage you in what you can do to help birds. Um, top number one thing in the springtime, actually the fall is another great time, is to create habitat for birds. And the best way to do that is to plant native plants. Um, Audubon has a great database, uh, or Plants for Birds database, where you can enter your zip code and it will generate a list of native plants specific to the birds that you'd like to attract to where you're planting. Um, so creating habitat is an excellent, excellent thing to take action for the birds. And then I mentioned eBird earlier. Um, so reporting your bird sightings is a really powerful way to help scientists learn more about bird populations and how those are changing over time. Um, so I, I also mentioned eBird as a tool that we're using for our chimney bird, chimney swift recovery project. We also use it um, to help um, community scientists um, with our bald eagle monitoring project. So eBird is a really great tool to familiarize yourself with. And then the third thing I wanted to mention is that we are having a birdathon, and it is coming up on Saturday, May 22nd. And this is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Um, and you can choose to donate to birdathon, and you can also um, choose to participate in birdathon, or even make your own birdathon team. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to our website, it's right, right on the homepage, or you can go to vt.audubon.org slash birdathon. And tonight we're actually having a birdathon trivia night. So if you'd like to do another birding event today, um, it's seven o'clock, it's a trivia quiz to help get your ears and your eyes turned up, tuned up for birdathon. All right, and that, that wraps things up for today. Thank you for taking a little extra time uh, with me today. And uh, we will definitely share these resources and links with you um, in an email afterwards. And if you'd like to sign up for our, um, 
for our email, we'll, we'll give a link to that as well. So you can get updates about programs that are coming up. Um, and AARP is hosting a program just next week that I'm gonna be co-presenting, which is about our priority bird species that we protect here in Vermont. So anything that you'd like to share, Debbie, before folks head off the call? No, thank you, Gwen. I really appreciated everyone sharing their enthusiasm and um, their tips with one another in the chat. It's been a wonderfully active chat. Um, so thank you all for coming. And also just let us know if there are future programs, assuming <laughs> Laura and AARP have us again. But like I said at the top of the call, this um, program is come to you today partially from another viewer who said, I would love to learn about and fill in the blank. So um, if there are things that you would love to learn about that we can help by all means, um, we would be happy to, to do that and, and provide you all with some more um, naturalist education. As I'm sure that you all are familiar with um, throughout the pandemic here while folks have been close to home, people have really been slowing down and paying attention um, to those things happening to the around them in the natural world. So um, we, we love that and we are always happy to help folks learn, learn more. So let us know what you'd like to learn more about. Um, and we'll make sure that all of these resources uh, get compiled and sent back out to you. So thank you again. And thank you, Laura and AARP for having us. Thanks, everyone.